Dr. Olushe Wali. Uh, I'm an assistant uh, professor of uh, medicine at the Division of Cardiovascular Disease at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, today I'll be talking about transchiatheric aortic valve implantation or replacement, uh, short term uh, TAVA. I have nothing to disclose today. Uh, the learning objectives will be to identify candidates for transcutaneous valve uh, placement or replacement, understand the novel alternatives for management of aortic stenosis, and please the latest uh, randomized clinical data in context. Uh, our outline will look at the role of TAVA for inoperable patients with aortic stenosis, how TAVA compares uh, with surgical valve replacement for high-risk patients with aortic stenosis. We talk a little about the complications of TAVA, the cost-effectiveness of TAVA, and f future directions. We'll start with the case, uh, HES, a 75-year-old gentleman uh, with a class 3 to 4 heart failure on Can Canadian class 2 angina. He's had prior bypass surgery, uh, prior strokes, right carotid endotracheotomy. He's hypertensive, dyslipidemic, he's had sleep apnea, and he has a history of duodenal ulcer. Um, he comes in with short, shortness of breath. Uh, his echo showed an EF of 65%, gradient of uh, 58 uh, millimeters of the mercury mean, valve rate of 0.78, and a uh, RV pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury. His annual loss by TTE is 23 and 24 by TE. Uh, calf uh, hemodynamics showed similar gradients. Uh, with a mean grade of 56 millimeters of mercury, valve of 0.69 centimeter squared, and the scatter output is 5.4. All right, so on uh, coronary angi uh, angiography revealed the uh, patent grafts. He had a lima to the LAD, vein graft to D2, vein graft to OM, and the uh, diffuse 50% RCA uh, lesion. Uh, his hemodynamics at the at cath also showed severe aortic stenosis. You can see the aortic and the left ventricular waveform here uh, with a mean grain of about 40 millimeters of mercury period. Usually these patients get a, a CT angiogram looking at their iliac, iliofemoral arteries and uh, the position of the heart in the, uh, within the chest. His iliac angiograms revealed that they had uh, large iliofemoral arteries. Usually with the uh, with TAVA, we usually want the, uh, uh, the iliac on the femoral arteries to be at least 7 to 8 millimeters in diameter. His were about 10 to 12, so they were adequate for the procedure. We plugged his risk into the STS uh, online risk calculator and his um, risk came back as about 12.3%. Before we go into the patient, just a brief overview of uh, patients with AS. Uh, we know about 30 to 40% of patients with AS, severe AS, go untreated. Usually these are patients that are managed by primary care docs and they are not referred to a cardiologist or a surgeon for several reasons. Either they are too frail, too old, too sick, um, they are asymptomatic. Um, but we also know that patients that are asymptomatic or they are not treated have poor outcomes. Uh, this is a study uh, done by uh, Pai et al., which, which looked at patients that were asymptomatic with severe aortic stenosis, and they showed that if you did not get surgical aortic valve replacement, so, uh, replacement you did poorly. So your survival uh, uh, with AVR versus no AVR was 94 versus 67 percent, and at five years was 90 percent versus 38 percent. So being asymptomatic uh, still confers a major risk uh, to these patients. We also know that if you have uh, severe aortic stenosis and you have uh, uh, asymptomatic or free of symptoms, your survival goes down. A study by Patricia Pelica at the Mayo Clinic uh, showed that uh, patients that, uh, that uh, their survival free of symptoms uh, declined as years went by. Uh, about half of them were more or less uh, dead uh, at about four to five years uh, with severe aortic stenosis, uh, determined as a Vmax of more than four meters per second. So back to our patient, a uh, patient who typically uh, undergo an aerogram at the procedure. They are brought into the hybrid OR and they are intubated and sedated. Usually we have uh, access uh, through the groins. Uh, the uh, valve delivery access may be through a cut down uh, performed by the surgeons or it may be done percutaneously uh, and uh, close bit uh, per close uh, sutures. Uh, here we have the um, pigtail in the ascending aorta. Uh, we have an aerogram showing the three uh, sinuses in alignment. We have a swan gans in the pulmonary artery. We have a 
five French pacing cath and the right ventricle. Um, the valve is delivered under rapid ventricular pacing. We also have a TE probe uh, uh, for intraprocedural imaging. So the audiogram is performed. We're happy with the position of the valve uh, cusps. And then uh, this is the valve being delivered. This is a transfemoral approach of the cath and the ascending order coming around. It's a balloon expandable valve and under rapid ventricular pacing. Uh, we make some adjustments to the position of the valve and uh, the valve is subsequently deployed. Uh, usually once this is done, we check uh, for paravalvular leak, we check for LV function, make sure the corner is uh, ostia free and if everything looks good, uh, we take everything out of the patient. Here is a post valve hemodynamics showing minimal gradients uh, between the left ventricle and the aorta and uh, uh, we usually perform a final uh, aeroiliac angiography to make sure that there is no trauma uh, to the iliofemoral system and if this looks good uh, we then close the groin and extubate the patient. If for any reason we are unable to use the aeroiliac uh, arteries for reasons of uh, narrowing, uh, they are small, they have calcium as seen in this uh, picture, uh, other access sites would be a transapical approach, a transiotic approach, a subclavian or axillary approach, and some people have described uh, a venocaval approach where the valve is delivered uh, from the uh, IVC across the uh, atrial septum using a transeptal approach brought into the left atrium across the mitral valve and now uh, kind of uh, anti grade across the aortic valve. This is quite cumbersome but there are situations where the patient does not have any form of arterial access and this is the only access they have. Uh, this is an example of a, a trans aortic approach. The catheter is, uh, an incision is made, a median stenotomy incision or a small thoracotomy incision is made in the chest. The sheath is advanced uh, after the, uh, the aorta has been accessed with a, uh, with a needle and uh, the valve is delivered uh, into the left ventricle and pulled back and then uh, deployed. Uh, here we have a transapical approach where uh, a mini thoracotomy incision is made in the left chest. Uh, the posturing sutures are placed in the left ventricular apex. Uh, the valve system is advanced uh, into the uh, left ventricle and the valve is then advanced via the uh, aortic valve and deployed under rapid ventricular pacing. These are two other access sites that can be used for patients that do not have adequate iliofemoral arteries. Uh, we will now spend the next few minutes talking about TAVR, uh, transcatheotic valve replacement. Uh, the idea was conceived in 1988 by Dr. Anderson, uh, who performed the first uh, successful pig implant in 1989, and then it was granted to two U.S. patents in 1995 and 1998. Uh, this was his first in pig, where you have a, basically a, a surgical valve sewn onto a a metallic uh, cage of struts and delivered uh, into a pig. This led to the uh, birth of the Edward Sapien heart valve and this is a, a, I think a third generation Edward Sapien valve which is a bovine tissue uh, valve with pericardial mapping and uh, is uh, implanted on a stainless, stainless steel frame. It comes on a catheter that's the deflectable where you're able to deflect the catheter on the aortic arch. The other valve used is the self-expanding core valve bioprosthesis, uh, which has an outflow, a constrained portion, and an inflow ceiling portion. This valve is supraannular, so the valve uh, leaflets are uh, located above the annulus. Uh, the supraannular leaflet function is designed to avoid the coronaries, and it has an intraannular anchoring uh, portion. Uh, this is the first patient that was treated uh, successfully with a percutaneous valve. This was uh, uh, Dr. Cribier, and this was the Edward Sapien valve. And this was in 2002. So a couple of years ago, uh, there was a celebration of the uh, 10th year anniversary of, uh, of TAVA being performed in humans. Uh, the first trial uh, looking at uh, uh, TAVA uh, in a large-scale randomized fashion was a partner trial. And there were two cohorts, cohorts A and B. Cohort B was first published. This was looking at TAVA versus medical therapy for patients with inoperable aortic stenosis. Uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And basically what this showed was that in these high-risk patients uh, with a mean age of 83, um, 
with a SS score of 11.2, anything above 10% is deemed high risk. Uh, with severe heart failure or severe shortness of breath, majority of them in class 3 or 4 heart failure, uh, there was a benefit with TAVR. The distribution of patients, as you can see, 70% of patients were more than 80, 80 years old, so these were really old, old patients. Uh, but at one year, there was benefit with TAVR. Uh, at one year, uh, compared with medical therapy, there was a 20% absolute risk reduction with transcatheter valve. So 30% of patients with TAVA were dead at a year compared to 50% of patients with medical therapy. And this benefit in, uh, was sustained at two years. So this was quite significant. This was the first trial to show such a significant benefit of, a, of, a, of, a, of an intervention in cardiology. Uh, with a 20% absolute risk reduction, giving us a number needed to treat of five patients to save a life. Uh, we also looked at mortality or stroke, and uh, same similar issues. There was significant benefit at mortality or stroke with TAVR compared to medical therapy. Um, also looked at vascular complications. Um, because TAVR is such an invasive procedure compared to medical therapy, there was a slightly higher chance of vascular complication with TAVR. Nevertheless, the mortality benefits of TAVR outweighed the vascular complication. Uh, apart from mortality, uh, there was increased uh, benefit uh, with New York Heart Class. Uh, patients usually came in with uh, class 3 to 4 symptoms, and after a year or two, majority were in class 1 to 2 symptoms. So there was definitely an improvement in quality of life in those that survived. Uh, the valves did well. The main gradients coming into the procedure was about 44. Uh, post valve uh, replacement gradients were about 10. And at 1 to 3 years, gradients stayed at 10. Uh, same for the valve area. The valve area stayed at about 1.5 to 1.6 and was steady. So the valves did perform well over the first three years. The, uh, the results of the uh, partner uh, cohort B led to FDA approval of the device uh, for use and uh, that started the process of uh, transcatheter valve replacement in the US. The next uh, phase of the partner trial was a cohort A where they compared TAVR to surgical therapy. Now surgical therapy has always been the standard of care and for, for a new device coming in uh, I think it's the right thing is to compare it to the existing uh, standard of care. So the transcatheter valve was compared to surgical therapy in high-risk patients uh, who could have surgery but were high risk. And this is the two-year outcomes, which was published also in the New England General of Medicine. Uh, and you can see the patient characteristics here. They were still elderly patients. The STS score was still on the higher side. Um, most majority were in New York Cut Class 3 or 4. They've had prior cardiac interventions, uh, a fair amount of strokes, a fair amount of COPD. And what we saw here was that compared to SAVA, which is surgical aortic valve replacement, transcatheter valves did not, do, uh, did not do poorly at all. It was comparable. So at one year, uh, the risk uh, of all-cause mortality with TAVA was 24% compared to 26% with surgery. And this extended up to uh, two years. And uh, there was no difference in mortality between uh, surgical therapy and transcatheter valve implantation. Similarly, all-cause mortality or hospitalization was similar for TAVA and SAVA with no major difference. Functional class was, about, uh, was good in both uh, categories. Majority of patients came in at class three and four, and at one to two, at that one year, majority were class one to two. So this was good. The valve works. The valve gradients were the same. Uh, the main gradients dropped uh, significantly and stayed low, and the valve areas also went up. So that was that was data on the Edward Sapien valve. The other valve in this arena that is uh, currently approved in the U.S. is the core valve. This is different from the Edward Sapien valve. It's a self-expanding uh, valve prosthesis, um, which has uh, been approved in Europe for quite a while. The cover of US trial uh, was recently completed. Uh, the first uh, to be published was the uh, extreme risk trial, where they looked at the core valve versus uh, medical therapy, basically. And they used the iliofemoral axis. So 
what what they did in this trial was to compare the performance of the core valve in, uh, uh, in patients with inoperable aortic valve stenosis and uh, compared it to outcomes based on older trials including the partner trial and balloon valvuloplasty trials so they set their performance performance goal at 43 percent that means that the valve had to have a mortality uh, or, or major stroke of less than 43 percent and what they've showed at one year was that the performance goal they obtained with the valve was 25 percent so it's quite significant so the the valve did uh, very well it was similar to the uh, edward sapien valve in this uh, patient population and the risk of uh, major stroke or mortality with the valve was 25 percent compared to more than 43 percent with medical therapy they also looked at all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality they were quite similar. The cardiovascular mortality was 17% and all-cause mortality was 24%. So this was good for the valve. Major stroke was low. The risk of major stroke was over 4.1% 4 at one year and uh, remained flat thereafter. Uh, the second part of the trial was a high-risk trial, similar to the cohort A trial of the uh, partner trial, looking at the core valve in different sizes and the uh, different access sites used in this trial was transfermal, subclavian, and direct aortic approaches. Here we had uh, nine, uh, 995 patients screened and they randomized almost 800 patients and the results uh, showed was, was quite dramatic. Uh, at one year, uh, all-cause mortality from a surgical valve replacement was 19% compared to 14% with the core valve. So this was quite dramatic. It was different from what we had with Court A of the uh, our partner trial, where the, uh, in the Court A of the partner trial, they were similar between uh, transcatheter valve and surgical valve. Here, the core valve showed superiority uh, over transcatheter aortic valve, over surgical aortic valve uh, replacement. And this was the first trial that was show that the transcatheter valve was much better than surgical valves, at least at one year. This was just published at the, uh, uh, in the New England Journal and uh, was uh, presented at the uh, last ACC meeting. Um, looking at the other endpoints in this trial, they looked at vascular complications. It was slightly higher with transcatheter valve versus surgical valves. There was more pacemaker implantation with the transcatheter valve was almost 20%. Uh, bleeding was higher with surgical aortic valve replacement. New onset of worsening atrial fibrillation was high with surgical valve, uh, valve replacement, and the risk of acute kidney injury was high with surgical aortic valve replacement. So we've talked about the two uh, valves on the market with, the, uh, with their respective uh, clinical trials. Uh, currently, the uh, Edward Sapien valve and the cover valve are approved and available uh, for use uh, commercially in the U.S. The next part of the talk will be to mention the complications with this procedure. Like any new, com like any new procedure, there are always complications. And with TAVA, the complications are quite unique. They are not all surgical. They are not all medical. It's always a combination of, uh, of both. And because it's a unique procedure, uh, if you're going to be doing this, you have to know uh, how to deal with the complications or what to look for and how to prevent complications. Uh, this, this list will show a list of complications that may happen with TAVA. Majority will be vascular complications. Stroke is always an issue and has been an issue with this uh, procedure. Paravalvular regurgitation, uh, risk of a complete heart block, valve embolization. Um, annular rupture is less common. Corner obstruction is less common. Renal failure can happen as we use contrast media. Myocardial infarction can happen. And obviously, uh, patients could die from this procedure. We'll now go over some of the more common complications and talk about their incidents and uh, options for avoiding them. Vascular complications appear to be the most common uh, when you look at all the uh, early trials from the partner EU trials to source partner one, the French and Canadian studies. What you see is that the, the incidence of vascular complications appear to be declining. Uh, some of the earlier trials used larger sheet systems. With the, with the advent of the 18 French or 16 French sheets, this is becoming less of an issue. As people get more comfortable with the procedure, it's becoming less of an issue. With uh, use of CT for screening of the iliofemoral arteries and being careful about patient selection, this is becoming less of an issue. So vascular complications that can be common, uh, they're getting better 
uh, they're commoner with the transformal approach compared to all other access sites and this slide shows the uh, comparing transformal to transdevical approach you can see that there is a high instance of vascular complication using the transformal approach compared to the transdevical approach um, the problem with vascular complication is that if you do have a major vascular complication there's a there's a drop in survival so this this was a study uh published in circulation where they looked at patients that underwent transfemoral tarver almost 500 patients uh 84 percent 84 percent of patients were alive at a year and they had no no complication compared to 72 patients percent of patients that had a major vascular complication. So uh, vascular complication is not just a pain, but it can also lead to uh, a poor prognos uh, prognosis in these patients. Here we, we look at transapical TAVR. If you didn't have any complication with TA, uh, transapical TAVR, you did better than if you did have a complication. So it's for real. It does happen in both, and it's associated with a reduced uh, survival. Uh, part of the uh, ways of dealing with this is to drop the sheet sizes. Currently, the uh, the approved device comes in a, uh, with a retroflex uh, catheter systems, which comes uh, uh, to be used in a 22 or 24 French uh, sheets, and uh, these are quite large. So, uh, and the the uh, the Cepin XT valve, which uh, has been trialed but not yet approved by the FDA is uh, compatible with an 18 or 19 French uh, delivery system. So, so these, are, these newer sheets uh, will reduce the uh, uh, number of vascular complications and, as they are easier to, uh, to deliver. Uh, the core valve is currently an 18 French system and there's an E sheath uh, uh, which is 16 French. So the sheets are getting smaller and the hope is that with a smaller delivery system the risk of vascular complications will get better. Stroke is a major issue. Um, the 30 day risk of stroke with TAVA was 4.6% in the partner trial compared to 2.4% in surgical uh, aortic valve replacement. And even after 30 days, there was still an uh, upward uh, take in the risk of stroke, uh, going up to about 7.7% at two years. Uh, we know that part of the risk of stroke is working on a calcific valve. Uh, the high risk, highest period of stroke is during valve deployment, either during valvuloplasty or uh, de uh, deployment of the valve. Some risk comes when we uh, kind of deliver the uh, valve across the uh, aortic arch. Uh, but even after the procedure is done, there's still a risk. So this has been called a lit stroke hazard. Part of the uh, adjustments made after the partner one trial was to put a button dual antiplayer therapy for at least three months to see if that will help with the lit stroke hazard. Um, with the use of smaller valve delivery systems, I think there's a decrease in the risk of stroke. Uh, so stroke is still an issue, uh, but it's, it's been looked at closely. Um, when we look at the distribution of, of, uh, of uh, neurologic events with the partner trial, uh, TAVA and AVR, um, majority of patients were uh, ischemic, uh, very few were hemorrhagic. Uh, but when you, when you look at TAVA compared to AVR, most patients had a major stroke. The major stroke was more common in surgical aortic valve replacement compared to TAVA. Uh, so patients that had a stroke following surgery may have a more uh, uh, dense deficit or a more prolonged deficit compared to TAVA. But regardless, stroke is definitely an issue. Uh, in the cough valve cohort, it's not as obvious. Um, in fact, the surgical arm had a higher risk of stroke uh, compared to the transcarrier arm. Uh, now, the core valve is an 18 French uh, delivery system. It's a little smaller. This may be part of the reason why there is less stroke uh, in this patient population. Uh, there have been uh, devices being looked at for um, ameliorating this issue of stroke. We have a percutaneous aortic device with cerebral embolic protection uh, during cardiovascular intervention. This is an umbrella device. The aim of this is to de deploy this uh, across the carotid and the uh, innominate arteries and kind of capture all the debris, uh, uh, leaving the aorta before it enters the um, uh, major vessels to the brain. This is still being trialed. Uh, we haven't seen any of the results from this uh, basic science trials yet. Apart from stroke, paravalvular regurgitation is an issue. Uh, this is a picture of a valve, uh, kind of a, um, 
pathological uh, uh, specimen uh, showing the uh, an area where the valve is not opposed to the aortic uh, annulus and this is where the uh, paravalvular leaks originate from we know that this is a typical tava post tava paravalvular leak this is posterior location close to the left atrium and you can see this this appears to be a moderate uh, paravalvular regurgitation uh, the, the problem with paravalvular leaks is that there is an association, association between paravalvular leaks and mortality. So when we look at the partner trial, uh, what we see is that patients that had moderate or um, anything more than moderate paravalvular leak had higher mortality compared to patients with mild or non uh, uh, paravalvular leak. So there's clearly an association with paravalvular leaks and mortality. Uh, nobody knows that that is a cause and effect but it's clearly an association. So there are, there are things that we do to prevent or ameliorate the severity of paravalvular leak. Uh, this is a core valve uh, trial where you look at the impact of paravalvular leaks on late mortality. Uh, patients with non or trivial uh, paravalvular leaks did very well compared to patients with moderate uh, or severe paravalvular leak. When this does happen, uh, usually uh, the valve can be post dilated to get to create better opposition to the uh, aortic annulus. Uh, a second valve may be deployed uh, to seal off the leak. Uh, sometimes we have uh, used amplats or occluders uh, to uh, seal off the leak. Uh, and then nowadays we have devices. Uh, the next generation valves are, de are designed to uh, uh, prevent this issue. Uh, one, one such example uh, is uh, uh, this valve here, which has two uh, cuffs, one in the aortic side, one in the uh, ventricular side. And these cuffs are kind of filled with fluid and they kind of grow around and seal the aortic annulus. Uh, the Lotus valve is designed to uh, um, also have a cuff in the lower bush and in the lower portion the ventricular portion of it where the the, the cuff is uh, uh is uh, uh kind of grows around the annulus and seals the annulus the sapien 3 valve is designed with a larger uh, cuff at the base and this is uh, um, uh, aimed at uh, preventing paravalvular leaks so we have space fillers we have sub annular fixation devices that can uh, prevent paravalvular leaks all these newer valves are still in trial uh, but some of them are showing a lot of promise in the reduction of uh, paravalvular regurgitation. And the next part of the talk is just to mention the uh, the com uh, comparison of TAVA versus surgical aortic valve replacement in terms of cost effectiveness. Uh, when we looked at the data from the partner trial, the index admission cost with TAVA uh, was about $72,000 compared to surgical AVR of $74,000. Uh, majority of the cost from Tava is still coming from the valve. The valve is still quite expensive uh, as it's new technology. But at the end of the day, uh, there is a reduction in ICU stay or hospitalization, and some of that cost was made up. So there was no major difference between the index admission cost for Tava compared to surgical AVR. And when we look at this, up to 12 months, uh, it was similar. Um, TF Tavar uh, compared to surgical AVR, uh, the follow up uh, 12 month costs were more or less the same, and the change, uh, the delta between the two was less than $300. So, Tavar is definitely cost effective compared to other things that we do in uh, uh, compared to dialysis and uh, cancer therapy. Uh, we see that in the uh, Tava is in this boot, uh, bootstrap analysis. Uh, Tava is still uh, quite cost effective compared to all these other therapies, and it's less than fifty thousand uh, dollars per quality of life uh, years. Uh, I've presented a lot of clinical trial data, and it's always good to always show some real world data if if available. So recently, the uh, there was a publication on the outcomes following a, a transcathode valve implantation in the U.S. Uh, led by Mark and Mark. This was uh, an analysis of the STS ACC uh, surgical valve registry, where they looked at almost uh, 8,000 8, patients uh, that undergone TAVA in the U.S. Uh, what they showed was that the mortality was 7.6 percent in one year, which is quite lower than uh, what has been published. The stroke risk was 2.8%, which is quite favorable, and the success rate 
that means delivering the valve at the, at the time of the procedure was 92 percent so this just shows that we've been able to replicate the uh the trial uh, uh success in real in the real world and this is important uh because as as a new uh, as new technology it's always important that we're able to uh, move this technology from uh, high volume academic centers to the real world where the patients are being treated. Uh, so this is quite encouraging data. Uh, of note is that the STS score in this patient group was a little lower than the trials, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think this was an excellent uh, publication. Uh, the other trial, uh, as we go, as uh, TAVA becomes more of a, uh, a well-developed procedure, uh, the next frontier is uh, moving to lower lower risk patients. Uh, one trial that's looking at this is a Sotavi trial, where they're looking at uh, patients with uh, STS score of between three and eight percent in the uh, in outside the U.S. and about four to eight percent within the U.S. So the aim of this is to um, see how this valve does in a lower risk population. Uh, the the earlier population looked at were the elderly high risk patients. But as as it as it valve becomes more of a standard of care, as we, as we try to make it more of a standard of care in the, in, in the medium risk patient population, uh, the Sotavi trial is designed uh, to look at this issue. Uh, the aim is to randomize about 1,800 patients and look at the one-year endpoint of death or stroke at two years follow-up. Uh, they're going to uh, look at Tavi and uh, PCI, uh, surgical valve and cabbage. And they're also going to look at TAVI uh, compared to surgical aortic valve replacement. So this is an ongoing study. Uh, the valve uh, in use in this study is the core valve. And uh, we eagerly await the results of this trial. Uh, future directions, there are several, several valves in, in uh, designs out there now being studied. Uh, we have the direct flow, the SADA valve, there's a St. Jude particle valve. Uh, they have all these other valves, endotech valves. All these are percutaneously placed valves uh, with different characteristics. Some of them are designed uh, to, to be better at uh, pre preventing paravalvular leaks, and uh, some of them are designed to go through smaller access sheets. In the transapical realm, there's a Jenna valve, the MDT engager valve, and the Cementis. All these are newer transapical uh, valve designs. Uh, the, uh, the, the SADA valve. Uh, is currently undergoing clinical trials and the hope is that in the next year or two we should have the results of that uh, clinical trial. So in conclusion, I think we've shown that TAVA is superior to standard of care for inoperable patients with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, TAVA compares favorably with surgical valve replacement in high risk uh, patients. The, the recent cover uh, trial data shows that actually TAVA was superior to uh, aortic, uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. There's a risk of stroke, uh, especially in the periprocedural period, and there's a late stroke hazard. Some of that is being mitigated by smaller valve systems, the use of dual antiplatelet therapy. Paravalvular leaks remain an issue. Uh, it's related to cal calcification, may predict outcomes, but the newer generation of valves are designed to deal with this issue. And TF-TAVA is cost-effective, and I thank you.